So my talk is Next Generation Secure Drop, and it's going to be about protecting journalists from malware. So brief overview, today I'm going to talk about the whistleblowing platform SecureDrop, and I'm going to motivate what the security goals are uh, for whistleblowing platforms like it, and then I'm going to explain how the currently deployed architecture works, what are some of the problems, and then um, how we are redesigning it in a second iteration. So before I start, I want to show the current team. These are all of the people who have been working hard on making this version of SecureDrop a reality. So let's get started. And I want to begin with a story of a whistleblower. Operation Merlin was a covert US operation beginning in 1997 in which the CIA provided flawed nuclear weapons blueprints to Iran. And the goal of that was to slow down their efforts to acquire nuclear weapons, but in the end, it was called by the journalist that broke the story, James Risen, one of the most reckless operations in the modern history of the CIA. According to Risen's reporting, providing these blueprints actually advanced the Iranian weapons program. So who provided this information about one of the United States' most secret ongoing programs? Well, this person was charged with espionage for providing this information to journalists. This is former CIA employee Jeffrey Sterling. He was identified using phone and email communications metadata. And in what was called a trial by metadata by BBC News, he was eventually convicted of multiple counts of espionage and sentenced to three and a half years in federal prison. So in that story, we saw one of the major security issues that journalists face while trying to connect with and protect sources. They need to communicate and keep the identities of sources secret in the case of a leak investigation after an article is published. That's the so-called first contact problem. And we know that in a leak investigation, some of the investigative techniques that are used are court orders to third parties. So these are third parties like internet companies or telecommunication companies. And there's often a gag associated with that court order such that neither the journalist nor the source even knows that their records or the source's uh, records have been seized. And so that leads to our first goal. We want to prevent the identification of journalistic sources. If a source wants to reveal their identity to a journalist or to the public, that should be their choice. And we also want to make sure that the materials remain secret until the time of publication. But there's another side to it. Uh, or to this problem, which is the threat to the journalists themselves. We've seen many uh, attacks on news organizations. We've seen news organizations be hacked, either their website, their internal infrastructure, their social media. And we've seen targeted attacks on individual journalists. And in fact, just today, you might have seen uh, Citizen Lab shared a report regarding New York Times journalist that was targeted with Pegasus spyware, where he was lured into clicking on a supposed document with the promise of interesting information. And this threat of phishing and malware is particularly challenging for this population because part of their work is opening uh, files from potentially unknown sources. And that leads us to our third goal. We want to protect journalists from being compromised via opening potentially malicious documents that they're sent by purported sources. And this goal is going to be the focus of this talk. But first, I'm going to recap how SecureDrop presently handles these three goals. So for those of you that aren't aware, SecureDrop is a whistleblowing platform that's currently used by these news organizations, among others, for source journalist communications. And the way that it works is this is a uh, brief architecture diagram. So each installation is on-prem and consists of two servers at each news organization. One server is, we call the application server, it runs two web apps, one uh, that sources use, one that journalists use, and both are available only uh, as Tor Onion services. And that's a service that's available only via the Tor anonymity network. So this is what the web app that sources use look like. So uh, if they want to upload stuff for the first time, then they click get started, and if they're a returning source, they, they can read messages that journalists have left them. And people do have kind of long-running conversations through this. Um, the other server is running a host-based IDS, OSEC, which sends alerts to administrators. Administrators in this context means admins at the uh, news organization, the IT staff there. And then there's also a network fi firewall that segments the secure part of the network from the rest of the infra. So documents and messages that are submitted by sources are stored encrypted to a public key associated with the instance. And to make use of those documents, the story for a journalist is they log in using an online workstation that's only ever used for secure drop. And the OS that we use for that is Tails, which is a live operating system based on Debian. So they, they go ahead and log in. Uh, one of the nice features of Tails is this amnesiac feature. So minimal state is persisted across reboots. So that's nice for the malware situation. They go to this second web app that I talked about earlier. They download these encrypted documents. And then the kind of more challenging part for them occurs. They 
copy those encrypted documents from this online workstation onto some kind of data transfer device. Sometimes that's USB drives, sometimes it's burning a CD, and they traverse an air gap. So they take these documents onto an air gap workstation that also runs the same operating system tails, and that is the only place where the private key is to decrypt the docs. And so they decrypt stuff there, read it, and decide what to do next. So that's the story so far. Uh, so what, what is the purpose? What have we accomplished? We've minimized the metadata trail. We know that the source is using Tor, which means they're not you know, directly emailing journalists or calling journalists like in the Ryzen, uh, so, yeah, well, the Ryzen and Sterling case, so that's good. There's no uh, third party to subpoena. If there's anybody to subpoena, it's by sending a court order to the news organization directly for like the keys to decrypt the documents stored on the servers that are on-prem. And so there's significantly more political cost associated with doing that. Um, and the news organization would learn about it such that they can fight in the legal system. And finally, if an attacker gets code execution, if malicious documents are, sought, are submitted to this third goal, uh, they need to jump the air gap to exfiltrate any data. So. That's great uh, in theory, and that's what's currently deployed, but from running this in production for a few years, we've observed a few issues. And uh, spoiler alert, the issues are gonna be basically under two umbrellas. One is too much operational complexity for both journalists and admins, and the other is gonna be insufficient compartmentalization in the air gap environment. So now let's kind of step through that architecture we just learned about, and we'll describe the issues. So the first is that this air gap process, as it sounds, is pretty cumbersome. You know, the process is cumbersome when there's a shoe in the architecture diagram. And that leads to, in some cases, security failures where users will work around the air gap for convenience and ease. They'll take the private key and they'll put it on a networked device. And it's rare, but it's something that we have seen. And, and to be fair, it's pretty understandable. If you have a large quantity of traffic coming in through SecureDrop, it's your responsibility to check it that day. Uh, and you have to do this every time you want to read something new. It's a lot of time, and journalists have lots of things to do that aren't you know, jumbling around with laptops and USB drives. Another issue is the air gap is not really a true air gap. You know, I described the USB drives going in to the air gap, uh, but those USB drives are reused in the case of people using USB for transfer. And again, that's done for convenience and ease, since burning CDs to, the doc to bring the documents into the air gap is a significant burden. So why is that bad? If an attacker can get code execution in the air gap environment, they can put whatever they want back on that USB drive. So they can put the private key on there, they can put other sources documents in there, and all those documents and the key are in the same environment. And the journalist is gonna dutifully take that USB drive back to a network connected device. Another challenge is just kind of the maintenance of air gap systems. So, you know, obviously we can't have automatic updates if the machine is air gap, so that means that Unless someone is really diligent about keeping it up to date by manually bringing patches in, what actually happens in, sometimes in practice is the environment that we want to be the most hardened and the most protective where all the secrets are is becoming a softer and softer target as a function of time as it lags behind in updates. And finally, something that we've seen in production is people specifically target the air gap, the secure drop air, air gap with malware. So a few years ago, we had a, a security researcher as a demonstration send malware to instances, to live instances, exploiting a known vulnerability to sign a message to himself using the secure drop private key. And so the problem there is that the air gap environment is where the submission private key is used and it's effectively unprotected once an attacker gets code execution. So now we'll take a few steps back now that we've learned about these challenges. Informed by these issues, what do we want? Um, well, first and foremost, we all know that we wanna make sure that known vulnerabilities are patched. We also wanna isolate the submission key from potentially malicious submissions. We also want to isolate each source's document. So if source A is malicious, they should not be able to access source B's material. And we want to recover from an attacker that gets code execution in the, I guess, spoiler alert, we're going to use VMs, in the VM used to uh, open submissions. And while we're at it, if we can provide defense in depth to defend against unknown vulnerabilities, uh, that would also be great. 
So we have some other design considerations based on these challenges that I just described. It has to be maintainable by non-specialist IT staff. It's pretty rare uh, at a news organization that there is someone who you know, will even be kind of familiar with Tor uh, and some of these systems. Like It could be like a window shop and, and the Linux command line might not be uh, that familiar to folks. And the harder challenge is it needs to be usable by journalists. So that means obviously no command line. Journalists don't really care what a private key is. They don't you know, need to know the details. They just want uh, the spicy docs. Um, so yeah. Uh, so what we're going to use is Cubes. So Cubes is a desktop-based Zen distribution. And uh, so Zen is a hypervisor that's commonly used in cloud environments. And so we're going to learn a few pieces of what we need to know about Cubes so that we can use it to redesign SecureDrop. So we have our hardware. Zen is running directly on the hardware. And then there's a control stack that's running in a special privilege VM called Domain Zero, and in Cubes, that's running Fedora. And so that's where we're going to run the logic to provision the rest of the system. And in Cubes, it's also the domain that's running the window manager. So the desktop user, and in the case of SecureDrop, the people that maintain the, this workstation are going to be defining different security domains slash VMs, same thing, and run applications or set of applications within them. And so we're going to call these domains uh, app VMs. Each one of these unprivileged domains doesn't have direct access to the hardware, it's because we have Zen in between, so there's no mic unless we explicitly allow permission for that VM to use it. In Zen, you can assign physical uh, devices to a guest VM. So if you want to pass through a USB mic, you can do so, but you uh, have to do it from uh, domain zero. And in cubes, each app VM is based on a template, which is your OS of choice. So for security, we're mostly using Debian, but you can have as many as you like. And the relationship uh, between app VMs and their temp templates is as follows. When a given app VM boots, it begins with the state of the parent template VM at the time of boot. And from there, the state diverges. So that app VM will then reset to the state of the template VM after it gets shut down, except for a few directories, including home. So any other changes don't persist a reboot. So that's also quite nice for the malware case. The other concepts that we need to know is a disposable VM, which is what it sounds like. It's a VM that's used once, and then upon shutdown, it's destroyed. And so the next time a disposable VM of that type is uh, booted, it's a new VM entirely, and it begins with, again with the state of the parent template VM at the time of boot. So as I mentioned earlier, since each of these unprivileged domains doesn't have direct access to the underlying hardware, we can have VMs which, from their perspective, don't have a network interface. So that's a great place for us to put secrets like private keys or other sensitive data. And then the other three things we need to know about is the network stack is running in its own VM. So if there's a vulnerability in like DH client, it's just going to uh, compromise that one VM. We have another VM for our firewall rules, because if someone uh, pops the network VM, we don't want them to rewrite the firewall rules. And then uh, we have our USB controllers all assigned to a separate VM. And those three are uh, maintained by Cubes by default. So if we want to pass some files or data between VMs, then we can do that using a mechanism called QRExec, which is based on uh, libvchan and Zen. And that's the mechanism we're going to use to have VMs talk to each other. So, now we know everything we need to know about cubes. So how are we going to use this? So instead of having this physical isolation between these online and uh, air gap workstations, we're going to use the isolation between security domains in cubes to do so. So instead of these multiple devices, we want to have this single workstation and just have one laptop. So let's zoom in on what's going on. Yes, animation. OK, so first we have uh, our network VMs. So Sysnet's connected directly to the internet, so there's some attack surface there. And then our firewall rules are applied. We know that we need to run the Tor process, since I said that to connect to this web app, we have to connect to a Tor onion server. So that's going to make our connection to the secure op server. And then the final VM that has network is what I'm calling here a forwarder VM. And what it does is it takes requests for actions from the user, like, hey, I want to download this file, uh, and passes that to the secure drop server. So what the user is interacting with is a GUI that is running in a non-networked VM. And so when the user triggers an action, it talks to the forwarder VM and gets responses back through that. The private key material is stored in a separate VM, and so the GUI has to call out to it to perform crypto operations. 
And then if a user wants to open a potentially malicious file, it gets opened in one of these disposable VMs, and the disposable VMs in this case don't have network, uh, because if an attacker gets code execution, we don't want them making network calls. So they don't persist, they, don't get, they, they get destroyed after use, and there's one per document. Since these VMs, we want to have the strongest protections. We want to prevent an attacker from getting code execution if we can. We also have some other um, mitigations in place, like the use of a hardened kernel uh, to uh, make memory corruption vulnerabilities harder to exploit. And that's as a defense against unknown vulns that might exist in, or, you know, could exist in the applications used to open documents. We're talking like even so open office, stuff like that. OK, so now let's check in with our technical goals. So we wanted to make sure that known vulnerabilities are patched. So we can do that now that all of these uh, VMs are based on templates and we can update the base templates. We can isolate the submission private key from potentially malicious documents. We did that by putting it in its own VM. We can isolate each source's documents. We've done that by running uh, whatever application that is used to open that kind of file in its own VM. And then recovering from an attacker getting code execution in the VM used to open submissions, we're doing that by just destroying the entire virtual machine. And then defense in depth are these additional mitigations uh, like kernel hardening. So the other design goals that we had were kind of the operational simplicity and usability. So this is a screenshot of this implemented. This is a screenshot within cubes. Uh, and so the window with like the yellow chrome is the GUI application. And so from the journalist's perspective, they interact with this. And so it's just like a chat app. And so it has like a Slack-like experience. And so as a journalist, you're kind of typing a response. And what's happening in the background is the, these messages are getting encrypted to the key that corresponds to the source by sending crypto operations to this other VM. Um, and then that encrypted content gets passed to that forwarding VM. But as a journalist, you don't need to know or care that that is happening. Um, it's all transparent to the user. And when you open a document, one of these uh, windows that is in the green window, Chrome, pops up to open the document in even, so whatever uh, application is relevant for that type. So for administrators, there's operational simplicity because they don't need to take patches into the air gap. All VMs get automatic updates. So they don't need to interact with the system unless something goes wrong. So the current status of this, so we've implemented what I described, and um, we got a third party security audit of this approach, both to validate the general approach architecturally and to identify any issues with the implementation. Um, and so that's public on our website. Uh, no major issues were found. And then we're beginning a pilot with selected news organizations to use this in production in the next few weeks. So some takeaways. So journalists and their sources face uh, growing challenges due to malware phishing and other electronic threats. And user-friendly technologies for working with potentially malicious documents are really critical for groups like journalists or really anybody that needs to open potentially malicious documents uh, and is operating in this kind of higher risk environment. And we presented one approach here that builds on Cubes OS and we're proceeding to roll this out with select news organizations. And if we're gonna enable people like uh, Mr. Sterling from our story at the beginning that have important truths to share with journalists and ultimately the public and ensure journalists stay safe while reporting on that information in the landscape they have to exist in, we really need technologies like this and cubes on which this is based. Um, so if you're interested in this, uh, Secure Up and Cubes are open source project uh, and this is the link to uh, the GitHub repository that has like the VM provisioning code and there's pointers to all of the other components. Or you can just come and talk to me after and I'll point you in the right direction. Uh, and uh, yesterday we just opened up a, a bug bounty to cover this project. Uh, so we had a bug bounty for Secure Up before, but now it's expanded to everything that I described here. So if you find security issues, uh, you can get rewarded, financially rewarded. So that is on Bug Crowd. Thank you for your attention.